32,000 people. That's how many people die each year on our roads due to traffic accidents. What's even more staggering is 70,000 people die each year because of the air pollution in the environment that we deal with every day. That's more than the people that die each year related to breast and prostate cancer combined. My name is David Klineski. These are my two beautiful daughters. And when I'm not at the American Girl store or I'm not in my front yard setting up a lemonade stand with them trying to you know, teach them to be young entrepreneurs, I think about these things and I think about things that can impact their lives going forward. And it's scary. Over the past 20 years, I've been working in the, the energy and water industry as a chemical engineer and a business leader. Recently, I've given a little bit more thought about transportation and the impact that it's having on our environment. Transportation has the most greenhouse gas emissions in the world. In fact, 75% of all the greenhouse gas emissions that go in our environment come from the transportation sector. The interesting thing is, the very thing that got most of us here today, that gets us to work, that gets us to school, that gets us around from point A to point B, is impacting our environment and also impacting our health. Now, I don't pretend to have a silver bullet on how we're going to fix all these issues. And it's a difficult issue. We all know that. But I do believe in the power of one. And I believe that each and every one of us in this audience can make a difference. And collectively, if we all make small modifications to our habits and behaviors, we can have a greater impact in the world. So let's break this down a little bit. Most of you own a vehicle or, or lease a vehicle or at least have driven a vehicle in the audience here today. Have you calculated how many miles you drive each week in your vehicle or let's say each month? But more importantly, have you calculated the amount of emissions that that car or truck or whatever vehicle that is has generated while you've driven those miles? Let me try to put all this in a little bit of context. For every gallon of gasoline that your car consumes or uses, it produces approximately 24 pounds of CO2. Now, that's a pretty abstract number, hard to get your head around it. I'm an engineer and I have my hard time figuring out what's 24 pounds of CO2 look like. If you take the average day in the United States and you collectively figure out how many gallons of gasoline are consumed, multiply that number by the 24 pounds per gallon of gasoline, what you're able to do is fill up the Superdome in New Orleans, which we've all seen, over 600 times every single day. Every single day. So when we hear energy efficient vehicles, we hear hybrid vehicles, we hear battery electric vehicles, those are, the, those are the vehicles, those are the things that can actually impact that number and reduce the amount of CO2 going into our atmosphere, into our environment. Now another area that uses transportation are fleet vehicles. And this is a pretty interesting fact. About 40 million Americans, around 50% of U.S. households, actually have an Amazon Prime account. Most people probably have one here. I have one. And why do we have an Amazon Prime account? Because we want things to be delivered to our house, very efficient to get packages on the next day or two days later. But have you given thought to how much emissions are generated with those fleet vehicles traveling across the United States to deliver packages and goods across the world? Well, let me help put that into perspective as well. So if today we took the fleet of vehicles that transfer goods in our, in our country and we converted them to all electric, so we're going to go to an extreme, we convert them to all electric, okay? What we would be doing is over the next 15 years eliminating 1 billion tons of CO2 going into our atmosphere and into our environment. Now, again, big number, right? What's a billion tons look like? So... I'm about six feet tall when I stand on my tippy toes, close. If you stack five of me up, so 30 feet in diameter, and you blow a balloon up, try to illustrate this here, you blow a balloon up 30 feet in diameter with CO2, and you blow another balloon up and another balloon, you keep blowing balloons up and stack them side by side, you circle the earth 230 times, 230 times. That's what a billion tons of CO2 looks like. And that's what we could potentially eliminate from our environment. 
Now, again, this is a complex issue. I understand that. But for us to be able to come up with hybrid, other types of energy sources for transportation is, is absolutely critical. Why, why am I talking about emissions, right? In the end of the day, it comes back to our health. Those two little girls that I mentioned up there, I'm worried about their health. So let's talk about health and the impacts that this has on our health. Another industry, the food industry, highly regulates the ingredients that go into food, right? You pick up a package of food at the grocery store and you read the, the label on the back and it tells you pretty explicitly what that food has in it. Preservatives, additives, all those kind of things. And why? Because we want to know what's going into our body, right? We all want to know what we're putting into our body and how that potentially has an impact. Now, when you got here today, did someone greet you up front with a little ticket that said, here's the air quality that you're going to be breathing today in Baton Rouge? Or did you get one when you travel somewhere else? No, we unfortunately, we don't get those. Now, there is an app, by the way, surprise, but there's an app that you can actually look at air quality around the world, right? And, but what, has, what does happen is the World Health Organization, so WHO, has done a number of studies on air quality and the impacts on our health. And one area that they focused on is something called particulate matter. So these are the very fine particles that are in the air that we breathe in. And the reason they focused on that is because those particles are hard to get out of your lungs once they're in there. And what they've said is anything greater than 25 parts per million of particulate matter, anything greater than that is, is unsafe. So below 25, you're okay. Above 25, and clearly the higher the number, the worse it gets. Now, let me give you a couple examples. I was in China just last week. Spent the whole week touring around, visiting a bunch of, of clients there. And on my last day, I was in Shanghai. And I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out my app and take a look at what the air quality today is in Shanghai. So I pulled out my app. 223 parts per million. Ten times, ten times the safe limit that the World Health Organization recommends. And this just isn't an anomaly. It happens once in a while. This is happening very, very regularly in large cities where there's high concentrations of people, high concentrations of vehicles, vehicles that are running on traditional fossil fuels. Now, that gets my attention, right? But what gets my attention more is it's happening here in our backyard. You look outside today, it's gorgeous, right? The air quality doesn't look anything like this. But when you do look outside, you think, I wonder what's in the air. And what's happened is the National Resource Defense Council has done a bunch of studies on the air quality across the United States in a number of cities. And what they've said is that one in eight children, and this hurts me because, again, those two girls up there, one in eight children will develop a respiratory illness before they're a teenager. One in eight. So when I think about my daughter's class, they have between 20 and 25 students in that classroom. Three of those children are going to develop a respiratory illness that's going to affect them for their entire lives. And that's just because of the air they're breathing. So, we have an issue. It's here. It's now. We've got to work on how to fix that. We've got, about, we've got to think about ways and alternate sources of energy that will power our transportation fleet going forward. Now, a lot of people talk to me and, and raise questions about the issue, and we have some really good dialogue about this topic. I hear a lot of excuses. You know, electric vehicles are expensive, and it takes them a long time to charge, and they can only go very far. And David, like, have you looked? Gas is only like $1.70 a gallon right now. Like, I can fill up my car with gas and drive, drive forever, right? It's more than about saving money on gas. This is about impacting our lives. And I think that those little inconveniences that we may have to deal with today that are eventually going to go away, those minor inconveniences I can handle if I'm going to protect the health of myself, of your family, of my family, of other people that we know. Again, this is an extremely tough issue to, to, to solve. And typically tough issues, you have to deal with the economic aspects of them, the health aspects, and the environmental aspects. But I think we can do it. The traditional use of fossil fuels that we have today cannot be the only source of how we transfer and, and use our transportation sector. We've got to continue to search for ways. We've got to continue to challenge industry 
We've got to continue to challenge our cities and states to find ways where they can come up with alternate sources of energy to power our vehicles. So, back to my original point, the power of one. All of us here collectively can make a difference. We all use transportation every single day. So, I'll ask the question, what's everybody here willing to do? Maybe not today, tomorrow, the next day, but in the near term, what are you all willing to do to ensure that yourself, your families, your children, your friends will live safer and healthier lives? Thank you.